technique called spectroscopy, which means when we look out at the different wavelengths of light, we can say what happens at this wavelength, and this one, and this one, and this one, that we can look at the individual wavelengths of light and say, are there characteristic atoms or molecules that emit or absorb these particular frequencies of light that we're looking at? And there are. So, what types of molecules exist in the center of our galaxy? Well, we don't find DNA, but we do find these guys. These are complicated carbon-based organic molecules. They are known as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And if you expose molecules like this to ionizing radiation, like the kind emitted by our sun and other stars, you can get long-chain nucleic acids. We also find amino acids, the building blocks of protein, in space. We also find sugars in space. We also find this molecule, sorry, which you may not know. This molecule is known as ethyl formate. You may recognize it because you've smelled it before. Ethyl formate is the molecule that makes raspberries smell like raspberries. So if someone asks you, what does the center of the galaxy smell like? Now you can tell them that it smells like ethyl formate. Well, ethyl formate and poison. So, um, but that's pretty good. We make lots of complex organic molecules in space just on their own, just from chemistry and radiation in interstellar space. So if we can make that in interstellar space, then it doesn't seem that far-fetched that we can take that next step here on Earth and naturally arrive at a molecule that can reproduce itself. In fact, if we look at all the different elements, the different building blocks of all these molecules, we find all of them here on Earth, all the way up to element 82, lead, elements are stable all the way up to element either, let's see, either 92 or 94, depending on who you're asking, who you're asking, uranium or plutonium, we find naturally here on Earth. And if you go back in time, you would say, hang on, did all of these elements always exist? We need these elements to form the life we have now, to form the planets we have now. But we think at some point in the very distant past, we were not full of all of these vast diversity of elements. If we go back far enough in time, it turns out these two, hydrogen and helium, made up 99.999999% of the universe. In other words, less than one millionth of one percent of all the elements in the universe were something other than hydrogen or helium. How did they get here? We know that interstellar space is full of them. You can't have these complicated molecules that we see without having these heavy atoms that they're based on. So how did they get to be here? Well. If you start with a cloud of gas, a cloud of molecules, due to gravity, over time, it will collapse. And in fact, if we look at a place where this has happened in space, we have a view in our galaxy. They tend to look like this. You can see the remnants of a collapsing gas cloud. You can see these little evaporating gas globules where the light from the bright stars that have newly formed are slowly evaporating away the remaining cloudy bits. The thing is, you'll look at this and you'll say, what do we have here? Sure, you start with a cloud of gas, it's going to collapse to form stars. You'll notice, I'm sure of it, the bright blue stars these are the things that catch your eye. These are the things that you would say dominate this star cluster, this region where we formed new stars in the universe. 
Here's the thing. Stars come in a great variety. The most easily visible are the biggest, the most massive, the brightest, and the bluest stars. But these are not most stars. If you look around within 10 light years of Earth and say, hey, I want to know how many of the stars that are closest to us are these bright O stars? The answer is zero. And say, okay, well, around us in our neighborhood, how many of these bright stars are B stars? Well, the answer is also zero. A stars? Well, now it's not zero. There, there are four. There are four A stars that are close to us. The thing is, if you ask about M stars, within that same distance you have to go to get four A stars, you have almost 300 M stars. These low mass, cool, red stars vastly outnumber the bright blue ones. So when we see a region like this in space, even though what dominates what we see are these bright blue stars, these red stars are far more common. In fact, our sun, we're pretty non-special over here. Our sun is just a G star towards the bottom of the spectrum over there. Here's another thing that's interesting about that. How many of you have seen the movie Blade Runner? Only a few. All right. Well, for those of you who haven't seen Blade Runner, um, one of my favorite lines from this movie comes when the mad scientist doctor talks to his most prized creation, this guy, Roy. And he says to him, the light that burns twice as bright burns for half as long. And you have burned so very, very brightly, Roy. Now he's crazy and he deserves to get killed. But the point, <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is for stars, it's even more extreme than this. If you're a star and you're more massive than another star, something even more spectacular than burning for half as long is going to happen. If you're a star with twice the mass of another star, you're not going to burn half as long. You're going to burn one-eighth as long. A star that's twice as massive as the sun lives for one-eighth the time of the sun. A star that's ten times as massive as the sun lives only one one-thousandth as long as the sun does. So these guys, the biggest, brightest, most massive stars in the universe, are also the shortest lived stars in the universe. They burn through their fuel the fastest. That's why they're so bright and so hot, because they burn through their fuel so quickly. So if we make this huge variety of stars, what's going to happen? These big bright ones are going to be the first ones to burn out, to run out of fuel. And when a star, a big, bright, ultra-massive star runs out of fuel, what happens? Well, it produces a spectacular type of explosion known as a supernova. But what's more interesting to me is what happens to all that matter that used to be part of a star that goes supernova. The answer is, it gets spit back out into interstellar space. All those heavy elements that you fused hydrogen into, you fused it into helium, and then you fused helium into carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, and then you added more nuclei to those things, and you made silicon, you made sulfur, you made iron, you made nickel and cobalt, you made the heavier elements in the supernova, and all of a sudden, interstellar space, the space like around the center of the galaxy where you're forming new stars, is full of these heavy elements. And what can you do with heavy elements that you can't do with hydrogen and helium? You can form, oh sorry, that's another picture of this. You can form planets. You can form planets, rocky worlds like us, 
that our world is not 99.999 whatever percent hydrogen and helium. Our world is less than 1% hydrogen and helium. Our world is almost exclusively these heavier elements, oxygen, carbon, silicon, with some very heavy elements in there. Right? Those are the ingredients that we need for life, is these heavy elements. So we come from previous generations of stars that have lived and died and spewed what was once their interiors back out into the universe. So we are formed from a combination of this old, pristine, unburned hydrogen gas and also this recycled star stuff in the universe. That's where we come from. But then you say, okay, okay. So you're telling me if I had this history of the universe, right, in our galaxy with all of this generations of stars that have lived and died and recycled their material and formed new stars and planets and those have lived and died and formed new stars and new planets and one of those is us. That's just our one galaxy. How did our galaxy get here? And in fact, if there were hundreds of billions of galaxies, how did all of those galaxies that contain all of these stars get here? Where did they come from? Well, here's something that's kind of remarkable. This is the same picture of galaxies I showed you at the beginning. And what you'll notice is, of course, this is a big, bright galaxy. You can see the spiral structure in it. You can see the dust lanes. You can see, you can see lots of interesting stuff. But what you'll also notice, if you don't just look at this galaxy, is there are plenty of other galaxies in the picture. These galaxies look fainter, they look smaller. And if you look at maybe this guy up here, you'll see that there are some really faint, really distant galaxies up here. I, I gave it away. I said distant. These galaxies, this galaxy for instance, is not necessarily smaller and dimmer than this galaxy. It could just be farther away. Here's something that's really interesting, though. When we measure the spectral lines from these galaxies that appear smaller, that appear fainter, that you wonder, are they farther away? It turns out that the smaller and fainter a galaxy looks, typically, the faster away from us it appears to be moving. So if we find an object twice as far away, we find that it's moving away from us roughly twice as fast. If we find something that's about 10 times farther away, it's moving away about 10 times as fast. And if we in fact look at that for all the galaxies that we've measured, this is what we find. This axis is a measure of how far away a galaxy is from us. It's if you want technically, it's the distant difference between the apparent magnitude of a galaxy, how bright a galaxy looks, and the intrinsic brightness of the galaxy, how bright the galaxy actually is. So this is a measure of how far away a galaxy is, and this redshift is a measure of how fast the galaxy moves away from us. And what you see is, this makes a really nice straight line. So the farther something away is from us, the faster it appears to be moving away from us. Now you might ask yourselves why. If that's what's going on, why is that happening? Well, according to our theory of gravity in the universe, according to general relativity, this is something we expect to be happening if this is the picture we look at. Imagine that the galaxies are like little points of paint on a balloon. Imagine that space is the surface of the balloon, not, not the interior of the balloon. We don't know what that is. So you'll have to imagine that space is only two-dimensional rather than three-dimensional. Space is what we're treating as the surface of this balloon. And this one point, that's us. That's our galaxy in the universe. What's going to happen as the universe expands 
as we blow this balloon up. Well, we're going to find that this galaxy will get farther away from us. It will appear to move away from us. But this galaxy is going to appear to move away from us twice as quickly. So, yes, this galaxy is now farther away than it was when it was over here. But the one that's farther away is going to expand and be even farther. And here's the thing. Any galaxy in this universe will see it as not moving, and we'll see all the galaxies around it receding from it. This is our picture of the expanding universe. And if we put this together, based on what we know, what we arrive at is a really interesting picture that tells us, hang on, if this is our universe now, where we see all the galaxies expanding away from us, and the farther you are, the faster you expand for us, then that means if we look at treat it like this balloon picture, that means in the past, things were closer together and things were denser. And so if we extrapolate not forward into the future about where are these galaxies going to go, but back into the past and say where did these galaxies all come from, we can go back and back and back to where things were closer together and denser. And so what would we say what can we say about that? Well, if you start at the beginning, where everything is roughly just uniform matter, and you allow it to expand, and you let gravity do its thing, I'm going to show you a video that scales the expansion of the universe out and says, if we just allow there to be matter in the universe, and we allow gravity to do its thing, and we allow the universe to expand, what's going to happen? And what you see happening is gravity collapses things first in lines, and then these lines intersect. These filaments intersect. And where they intersect, that's where you form the first stars and galaxies in the universe. The regions that attract more matter keep on attracting more and more matter. It makes gravity get stronger. So over time, we're going to see regions where there are galaxies merge together. Regions that are very rich in galaxies are going to attract even more and more matter and become giant clusters. And regions that are devoid of matter are going to stay devoid of matter. And they're going to lose their matter to the even denser regions. So if we do a simulation like this and we apply it to the whole universe and say, what does our universe look like today? We get something like this that you can journey through and say, wow, this actually looks exactly like what our galaxy surveys tell us the universe is. That there are regions that have sparse clusters of galaxies in them. There are regions that have pretty much no galaxies at all in them. But then you have these very rich, dense regions along lines and where filaments intersect, where you have big, rich clusters of galaxies thousands and thousands of big galaxies like ours in groups together. And so this is where galaxies come from. You start with a dense, expanding universe, you give it gravity and you give it time, and you get galaxies. You give those individual galaxies time, and stars go through life cycles, generations, where they produce heavy elements, which get incorporated into the next generation of stars and planets. And then you get us. And you might say, okay, okay, that's a very pretty picture, but you didn't tell me where all of this comes from, because you didn't tell me where all of this matter came from in the first place. You didn't tell me where the neutral atoms came from. You didn't tell me where the hydrogen and helium came from. Well, let's see if we can take a look at that question, that version of where does all this come from. So I'll say, look, here's something that's interesting. The energy that light has is defined by its wavelength. If you went back in time and you allow your universe to be smaller, space-time was smaller because it's expanding, but if you go back in time, and your light was still there, 
back in time, the wavelength of your light was smaller if the fabric of the universe is smaller. But a shorter wavelength for light means that your light was more energetic in the past. So if we go back in the past, arbitrarily far, you might imagine a time where light was so energetic that you couldn't have neutral atoms. Right? You know that atoms are bound nuclei or protons and electrons. But if you have light that is too energetic, it will knock the electrons clear off of the atoms. Right? If your light is above a certain energy, that energy is about 13.6 electron volts, if your light is more energetic than that, you're going to kick every electron out of its atom. And all you're going to have is an ionized plasma. And you can say, well, what if I extrapolate and go back even farther in time and said, I'm going to take these additional, these atomic nuclei, the groups of protons and neutrons that are clustered together, and go back to a time where the light was so energetic that you couldn't even form those. It would blast protons and neutrons apart. So all you would have then is a seed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. That's where we think all the atoms came from, is you had a sea of protons, neutrons, and electrons. They cooled enough that the neutrons that are left will combine two neutrons and two protons to form helium. That's where the helium in the universe came from. The protons that are left over, because there are more protons than neutrons, even if there aren't in my drawing, <laughs> you get you get hydrogen atoms from that when they combine with electrons. But then you'll say, okay, so if you start with a sea of protons, neutrons, and electrons in this hot, expanding universe, you can give me hydrogen and helium, which will then form stars. You can give me neutral atoms, which will collapse under their gravity. But you didn't tell me why we have protons, neutrons, and electrons to begin with. That's something you didn't tell me. Well, I will fully disclose right now that we are not 100% certain exactly how we got to have a universe with more matter, protons, neutrons, and electrons, than antimatter. But I will tell you, as far as we know theoretically, how we think we got to have this. This is all matter. Why isn't there antimatter? When we look up at all the galaxies, they are all made of matter. There are no regions where matter and an antimatter is seen annihilating in the universe. Every star, every galaxy that we know of is matter, not antimatter. So, I want you to imagine how this was back in, back in a time where there wasn't more matter than antimatter. I want you to imagine that all we had was energy. If you take matter and antimatter and you collide them together, they will annihilate and form pure energy, just light. But if you can do it this way, you can go in the opposite direction too. If you had two photons of just the right energy and you force them to interact with each other, they would form matter and antimatter. So we can take matter and antimatter and annihilate it and make energy, or we can take energy of just the right amount and make matter and antimatter. So if we have a hot, that means energetic, universe that was young, then we had a bunch of matter and antimatter flying around. But they should have existed in equal amounts. The thing is, you're not constrained to making protons and antiprotons, or electrons and antielectrons. There are many more particles that exist, that we know of, that aren't protons, neutrons, electrons, that aren't just the quarks that protons and neutrons are made out of. There are all sorts of unstable particles. I'm going to make one up. I'm going to make one up, and I'm going to call it Q. We have a particle that's called a Q particle. It's got a positive charge. We have a particle that's a Q minus. It's an anti-Q. It's the anti-particle of the Q. 
So, if what we think is true about the early universe is actually right, there's going to be equal amounts of this matter in a time pattern. And it's going to be unstable, and it's going to decay. Here's why this is important. When the universe is very hot, you can take matter and antimatter and have it annihilate and make energy. When it's just as hot, you can have the energy make matter and antimatter. But the universe is expanding and it's cooling. And when it cools past a certain point, you're not going to be able to do this anymore. The light, the energy in your universe, is not going to have enough energy to make that matter and antimatter anymore. You need to have a certain amount of energy to do that. And when the universe is hot enough and dense enough, you can. But as it expands and gets smaller, and sorry, it gets larger and cooler, you're losing energy. And so after a certain amount of time, you won't be able to do this anymore. Your matter and your antimatter, the unstable stuff, it's not going to find itself and annihilate, it's going to decay. What will it decay into? And this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to imagine there are two ways that my cube can decay. I can either become a proton and a neutrino, or I can become an anti-neutron and an anti-electron. There's a conservation law that says if you have a particle, you can change the number of either protons or neutrons. We call that baryons. And you can change the number of leptons. Those are either electrons or neutrinos. But you can't change B minus L. You can't change the number of baryons minus the number of leptons. So this Q has a B minus L number of zero. You can either decay into something that is a baryon, so plus one baryon number, and a lepton, plus one lepton number, because B minus L equals zero. Or you can have an anti-baryon and an anti-lepton, and again, B minus L equals zero. So in this case, we could say maybe 60% of the time, I'll decay to a proton and a neutrino, and maybe 40% of the time, I'll decay to an anti-neutron and an anti-electron. Just one way it could happen. Then I've got an anti-Q. Now we know, because of how antimatter works, it has to also, if a Q can decay to a P and a neutrino, then a Q anti-Q has to decay to an anti-proton and an anti-neutrino. And if this guy can decay to an anti-neutron and an anti-electron, this one can decay to a neutron and an electron. That's the symmetry between matter and antimatter. But there is one thing that doesn't have to be symmetric, and this is where we can make more matter than antimatter. The total rate needs to be the same. It needs to add up to 100%. But this, which is 60% for a Q, this doesn't need to be 60%. We can have this guy be the 60%, and that guy be the 40%. Those two things are allowed to switch. They'll be different. So if we took that, if we took my picture where I had equal numbers of cubes and anti-cubes, and I allow them to decay because the universe has cooled, what do I wind up with? Well, 60% of these cubes are going to become protons. 60% of these anti-cubes are going to be neutrons. 40% of these cubes are going to be anti-neutrons, and 40% of these anti-cubes are going to be anti-protons. Which means, I'm leaving the electrons and the neutrinos out because it gets messy. <laughs> Which means I'm going to get a big C like this, that's again full of matter and antimatter. Only this time, the amounts aren't equal. What we see instead is I've got a bunch of protons and a bunch of antiprotons, and I've got a bunch of neutrons and a bunch of antineutrons. But because these guys are closer to stable, they're going to find each other, the matter and antimatter. They're going to annihilate away. But when they do, because those two percentages weren't equal, I'm going to be left 
with neutrons and protons over anti-neutrons and anti-protons. So when these guys annihilate away, I'm left with more matter than antimatter. We have four different theoretical ways to make this happen. I've only shown you one. We do not yet know which way is the way that nature has actually chosen. So this is really the frontier of asking and answering the question of where all this comes from. If you want this to happen, there are only three general conditions that guarantee you get it. One of them is an out of equilibrium universe. That is, for example, a universe that is expanding and cooling, which we have. We know that happens. We also need to live in a universe where particles and antiparticles can decay differently from one another. And again, we observe this. This is something we've learned from particle accelerators, from colliders, from things like Fermilab and the Large Hadron Collider where they just found that Higgs boson. We know that's true. The one that we're not sure of how it's true is we need a universe that allows you to make more protons and neutrons than antiprotons and antineutrons. We know that this happened, but we don't know how it happened. And so if we want to arrive at the universe we have today, to ask where all of this comes from, we have our history. We had a hot, dense, expanding universe that made more matter than antimatter and then cooled. The protons and neutrons were able to fuse into either just protons or helium. The universe cooled enough that the electrons could join with them to make neutral atoms. Over time, the universe expanded and cooled enough and gravity worked well enough that we were able to form stars and galaxies. And over time, those galaxies grew and merged together to form the large spirals and elliptical galaxies we have today, including the clusters we have today. And inside each individual galaxy, stars go through generations of life cycles where they produce heavy elements, complex molecules, planets, and in some, at least one rare case, life. And so when we look at where does all this come from, that's hopefully a window to the answer. The last thing I'd like to show you is just, that's what, if this is our Milky Way, what does the universe look like in terms of a scale to us? These are the large and small Magellanic clouds. You can see them here from Florida in the summer under the right conditions, you have to go out pretty far away to get to the next large galaxy. Our galaxy is more than 10 times as massive as either of those Magellanic clouds. The next big galaxy are not these guys. These guys are gravitationally bound in between us and the next big galaxy, which is Andromeda. But Andromeda is over 2 million light years away from us. It is very far. All of this, Andromeda and the little galaxies bound to it, these little galaxies in between, this is our local group. Our cluster of galaxies is very small. And there are many small clusters or groups of galaxies in the universe. There's the Sculptor group, which is pretty close to us. But if you start going a little bit farther away, what you'll start to see is we can find larger groups of galaxies. We can find, for instance, the Virgo cluster, the nearest big cluster to us, which contains thousands of galaxies. You can find the Coma cluster, which is an even bigger one, which contains maybe three times as many as Virgo does. And if you start to look on the largest scales, you will see this spider web filamentary shaped structure into the universe full of hundreds of billions of galaxies. You will notice in this video that we have slices of the universe and that's because of how we do our surveys. We are trying to fill in all the different slices in the universe. This is going to take time and telescope money. So you should invest in astronomy. <laughs> And that's, really briefly, where all of this comes from. If you start 
with space-time and a hot, dense, expanding universe and the laws of physics, I can give you everything. I can give you our observable universe full of matter and not antimatter that self-creates stars, galaxies, heavy atoms, planets, complex molecules, and finally, you. And that's what we have. That's where, to the best that we know it, that's where all of this comes from. And I think this is a good place to end. So I'll thank everyone I stole images and videos from. <laughs>
So over time, in about 4 billion years, the Milky Way and Andromeda, the two largest galaxies in our group, will merge. We will eventually become one giant elliptical galaxy. All the other galaxies in our universe, as far as we know, the ones outside of our local group, they will continue to expand away from us and will never merge with us. But they have their own groups that they will merge into. Okay. Do we have time for one more or no? Yes, let's take one more. All right, go for it. Oh, the question is, where does God fit into all of this? <laughs> The best answer I will give you is based on the story I have told you, based on what science knows, if there is a God that exists, we don't need him for the story I told you. You may need a story to answer some of the questions outside of what I told you. Excuse me, it is that. But as far as the story I told you for where all of this comes from, although I can't either prove or disprove that there is a God, I will say it isn't necessary for the part of the story that I told you. The universe with the laws of physics in them is sufficient to explain this one.